the desert planet of Arrakis, two great houses are in conflict. The noble Atreides have been lured into a trap by the devious Harkonnen, and after Duke Atreides is killed and the Harkonnen take over, it is up to the Duke's son Paul to survive the harsh desert long enough to befriend the native Fremen and turn them against their shared enemy, the Harkonnen. Paul has been bred to be a potential next step in evolution, a super being called the Kwisatch Haderach, and Fremen legends might also make him their prophesied messiah. Arrakis is the sole location for a precious substance known as the Spice Melange, which not only bends minds to see through space and time, but is also a necessary component for long-distance space travel. Whoever controls the spice, controls the universe. Before we get started, if you could please hit that like button, it'll help this sleeping YouTube channel to awaken. If you really do like what I'm doing and want to see more, don't forget to subscribe as well. Thank you in advance. With that out of the way, let's get back to the subject at hand. In 1965, Frank Herbert published his science fiction epic, Dune. It quickly became one of the biggest and most celebrated science fiction novels of all time, and it wasn't long before Hollywood thought about adapting it. The story of Dune's original journey to the silver screen is almost as long and complicated as the novel itself, and it started in 1971 with producer Arthur P. Jacobs. Still riding high on the success of Planet of the Apes a few years earlier, its sequel already in production, Jacobs was looking for the next big science fiction franchise, and no science fiction novel was getting quite as much attention in those days as Dune. No one had yet purchased the rights, no doubt due to the practically unfilmable nature of the source material, but Jacobs was certain it could be turned into a feature film. By 1973, he had approached David Lean and Charles Jarrett to direct, and a screenplay was well underway for a projected start date of early 1974. Alas, in June of 1973, Jacobs died of a heart attack. With no other producers interested in taking the reins of such an unwieldy and ambitious project, the Dune adaptation was shelved and the rights were put up for sale to the highest bidder. It was a French team led by Jean-Paul Gibbon and Michel Sedo who won the bid for Chilean director Alejandro Jodorowsky a madman of a filmmaker who'd made a pair of notoriously bizarre films, El Topo and The Holy Mountain. Hodorowsky wanted to adapt Dune into a hallucinogenic, consciousness-expanding acid trip of a movie that would push the boundaries of the artistic medium further than ever before. For two years, Sedo and Hodorowsky plugged away at the project and assembled an impressive cast and crew, including the likes of H.R. Giger, Pink Floyd, Mick Jagger, Salvador Dali, Dan O'Bannon, David Carradine, Gloria Swanson, Orson Welles, and more. Hodorowsky's Dune was a bit too wild and ambitious for Hollywood, however, and when the French team tried to get an American studio to foot the bill for it, which was estimated at $15 million, the studios flatly refused, even as they expressed admiration for the work Hodorowsky and his team had put into it. Given that this was 1975, when the few science fiction films that were profitable were only grossing a fraction of Hodorowsky's entire budget, it's understandable that Hollywood turned them down especially when you learn that the film had a projected runtime of 10 hours. Don't get me wrong, I would have loved to have seen it, but it was never going to happen the way Hodorowsky wanted. If you'd like to know more about Hodorowsky's vision, I highly recommend the 2013 documentary on the subject, appropriately titled Hodorowsky's Dune. In 1976, Raffaella de Laurentiis, correctly predicting that science fiction cinema was on the verge of a renaissance, bought the rights from Hodorowsky's team and commissioned a new screenplay to be written by Frank Herbert himself. In 1979, De Laurentiis hired the up-and-coming Ridley Scott to direct, and Scott planned to divide and rewrite Herbert's script. Scott had just finished Alien at the time, a movie that had used a considerable number of team members from Hodorowsky's Dune, most notably Dan O'Bannon and H.R. Giger, and thus Scott was keen to work with them again. He had no intention of using Hodorowsky's outlines, but he nonetheless wanted to preserve at least some of the work that had already been done, knowing that his own vision for the adaptation, which had now become two films instead of one, was going to be a monster of a project requiring years of pre-production and preparation. However, once again, tragedy struck the seemingly cursed project when Ridley Scott's brother Frank died of cancer. Scott, overwhelmed by the years of work he saw ahead of him for Dune and eager to just get behind a camera, quit the project soon after, deciding to work on the relatively less ambitious Blade Runner. In 1981, after the release of The Empire Strikes Back, De Laurentiis began to see Dune as having the potential to compete with the Star Wars juggernaut, so Dino and Raffaella renegotiated with Frank Herbert for the film rights of the Dune sequels, including any that had yet to be written. 
They then tapped another up-and-coming director, David Lynch, to direct not only Dune, but also a pair of sequels. Lynch had made a big splash in Hollywood with his 1980 film The Elephant Man, which had earned him an Academy Award nomination for Best Director. Around the time Raffaella de Laurentiis came knocking, he had just turned down an offer from George Lucas to direct the then-untitled third Star Wars film, Return of the Jedi. Contrary to popular belief, he never had to choose between Dune and Star Wars. He turned down Lucas before de Laurentiis ever approached him. It seems inexplicable to people familiar with Lynch nowadays that he would attract so much mainstream attention, but this was well before Blue Velvet, Twin Peaks, and Mulholland Drive cemented his reputation as a mad auteur with deeply rooted indie film sensibilities. Sure, he'd already made a racer head, but there are some notable Hollywood filmmakers out there who began mainstream careers with comparatively bizarre, surrealist student films. Besides, it takes a touch of madness to tackle Dune, and Lynch seemed just crazy enough to work. Alejandro Jodorowsky, for example, a similarly unbound artist, felt that if he himself couldn't do it, then David Lynch was the next best choice. Seeing the future potential to have the freedom to make whatever he liked if he made Dune a success, Lynch agreed to do it, even though he'd never read the novel, wasn't familiar with it, and had little to no interest in science fiction. Nevertheless, he approached the project with gusto, cracking out several drafts of the screenplay himself after other writers failed to see his vision. Several notable actors were approached and auditioned for the lead role of Paul Atreides, including Val Kilmer, Rob Lowe, Dexter Fletcher, and Christopher Reeve, but it was newcomer Kyle McLaughlin who ultimately got the part. This was McLaughlin's first screen role, and would be the first of many collaborations between him and David Lynch. Other actors who circled the project but ultimately didn't land include Glenn Close as Lady Jessica, Aldo Ray as Gurney Halleck, and a virtual who's who of young actresses like Jodie Foster, Kim Basinger, Sarah Jessica Parker, Meg Ryan, Michelle Pfeiffer, Melanie Griffith, and more for the relatively minor role of the Princess Irulan, a character who would become more important in the planned sequel. Helena Bonham Carter was initially cast as Irulan, but a scheduling conflict forced her to pull out, with the role finally going to Virginia Madsen. We don't really have time to get into all of it, but suffice to say the acting talent on display is nothing to sneeze at. As an ensemble production, the final cast list is filled with names like Jurgen Prochnow, Brad Dourif, Linda Hunt, Everett McGill, Max von Sydow, Sean Young, Dean Stockwell, Sting, Patrick Stewart, and Richard Jordan. Around here, I'm Mr. Prescott. One fun fact while we're on the subject of the cast, Fade, as played by Sting, was originally planned to appear nude in this scene. Sting had enthusiastically agreed to do it, but the studio wussed out at the last minute, forcing the costume designers to improvise the now-famous winged thong. The majority of the film was shot in Mexico, utilizing the workspaces of the country's Estudios Churubusco, the largest and one of the most prestigious film studios in all of Latin America. While plenty of other locations were considered, like North Africa, Australia, Italy, England, and India, Mexico proved to be the best option due to the proximity of several desert locations and studio space. For Dune, there were 80 sets in constant rotation within 16 sound stages, with plenty of location shooting done in the deserts of Chihuahua and Sonora. One of the sites for filming, Las Aguilas, also known as Dead Dog Dump, required weeks of preparation, with crew members having to clean the area of decades of neglect, picking animal carcasses and trash out of the dust by hand. Then when it was finally pristine, they discovered that the dust, despite looking beautiful for the film's purposes, was much too fine and had a bad tendency to blow away when they turned on the wind machines. Elsewhere, in the Semalayuca Desert, heat became the primary problem, with cast and crew having to endure temperatures well into the triple digits. The still suits, which had been individually molded to be skin tight, were coated in layers of latex and black paint, and several actors complained that they were hell on earth to wear in such places. Other problems included altitude sickness in the mountains around Mexico City, delays from customs at the border, a fire that destroyed a giant front projection screen, very few telephone lines, and a particularly nasty case of Montezuma's revenge that forced the crew to bring in all the necessary food and water from the United States. Pre-production and principal photography in Mexico took over six months each, and post-production had to be rushed through a five-month window in order to meet looming studio deadlines. This was problematic given the intense focus the film had on effects. Thousands of models were built under the supervision of Ricardo del Rio, and most of the special and visual effects were supervised by Charles L. Finance, who would go on to work on films like Space Camp, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, and The Arrival. Considering the ambition, budget, 
time crunch, and relative inexperience of most of the effects crew, it's amazing the film's effects came out as well as they did, with Del Rio's models standing out as particularly imaginative and memorable. Worth special attention is the production design, handled by veteran Anthony Masters, known for his work on 2001 A Space Odyssey, Papillon, and The Deep, and the art direction, handled by Pierre-Luigi Bazile and Benjamin Fernandez, who had worked together before on Conan the Barbarian. All of the designs of the film, the sets, the costumes, the props, the models, and the unique aesthetics of four different fantasy sci-fi worlds come together to form what is, in my opinion, its greatest strength, the look of its universe. No other film looks quite like it, and I dare anyone to try to read Herbert's novel after seeing this movie and not picture these designs. Unfortunately, the movie was a critical and financial flop when it released in December of 1984, earning a domestic gross of slightly over $30 million against a $42 million budget. Critics were absolutely brutal as well, labeling it incoherent, soulless, and boring. Plans for a sequel were abruptly cancelled, and it wasn't long before David Lynch himself would disown it, blaming the interference of studio heads and financial backers for ruining his vision, even as he reluctantly admitted that he may have signed on for more than he was prepared for. He was particularly regretful of agreeing to sacrifice final cut privileges, An extended cut was assembled for television a few years later, but Lynch demanded to have his name replaced with the pseudonyms Alan Smithy as director and Judas Booth, a combination of Judas Iscariot and John Wilkes Booth, as screenwriter. Though this version is considerably longer than the original, it's not much of an improvement. There is a new and longer voiceover narration that holds the audience's hand a bit more, and a few minor scenes thrown in, but it's frankly not worth seeking out unless you're a superfan of the film. And yes, this film does have its fans, myself included. Its reputation for being one of Hollywood's biggest failures is legendary, and it is certainly a flawed film that was always destined to have nothing more than a cult following. Still, it's remained influential, with many of its images and lines of dialogue, including several iconic ones not found in Herbert's novel, seared into the brains of science fiction geeks the world over. It hasn't gotten the critical 180 of a film like 1982's The Thing, but it does have an important place in science fiction cinema history. It also has one of the most epic movie shots of all time, with Patrick Stewart leading the charge into battle, holding a laser rifle in one hand and a pug in the other. If that's not worth the price of admission, I don't know what is. Hollywood has taken a few stabs at adapting Dune a second time for the big screen, and next year, we will be getting the first of two by the astonishing new director Denis Villeneuve. I'm rarely ever enthusiastic about film remakes, but I can't even begin to tell you how excited I am for this one. Here's hoping it lives up to the hype. And that's all for today, my fellow Earthlings. What do you think? Is David Lynch's Dune an underappreciated work of genius or a piece of cinematic garbage that deserved its trashing? Let me know in the comments, but please be respectful. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already, and if you want to support what I do even more, head on over to my Patreon to get your name in the credits, watch the occasional bonus video, and more. You can also check out my website at emagill.com, where you can find reviews of several science fiction classics in both film and literature. I'm currently working on several Dune reviews, including ones for the original novel, some of its sequels, and the two television miniseries that came out in the early noughts. Until next time, when we'll be discussing whatever my patrons vote for, this is the Unapologetic Geek, telling you to never be ashamed of what you love. As long as you're not hurting anybody.
We brought you a little cat, Thufa. You must care for it if you wish to live. <laughs> 